Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Arya Lightstone, uh, author of Let My People Know and former senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador of Israel, join us to discuss the wider implications of the fighting in Gaza. Mr. Lightstone will speak for 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Ar Mr. Arya Lightstone. Thank you so much. I apologize that I'm late. We were just in the middle of a uh, briefing uh, of some Senate staffers to, uh, to try to discuss the regional implications. Uh, I I'm assuming everybody on this, uh, on this call in the Zoom is well-versed in what's occurred over the past uh, now 10, 10 and a half days. Uh, certainly when we woke up Saturday morning, I don't think any, last, October 7th, I don't believe any of us uh, anticipated what was going to occur. I don't think any of us could have imagined in a worst case scenario what could have occurred. Uh, so much so that the uh, uh, National Security Advisor, I think just 10 days prior to that, Jake Sullivan, uh, declared that the Middle East was in probably the strongest place that it had been uh, in decades. And I, I want to take that point sort of as a jump off. Uh, I had the privilege of working for the Trump administration. I worked for Ambassador David Friedman uh, with the U.S. Israel relationship. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then Jared Kushner, Avi Berkowitz, Mike Pompeo um, on the Abraham Accords. And when we left office on January 20th, 21, uh, we were riding a pretty hot streak of five uh, normalization agreements in between Israel and uh, an Arab or Muslim majority country, starting off with the UAE and then Bahrain, uh, and then Kosovo, then Sudan, and finally Morocco, uh, with several more ready to go. And the question is, how did those get done? What's happened since? And where are we today? So fast forwarding so we can spend time on where are we today, and probably more importantly, where are we tomorrow? Uh, essentially for three years from January 20th, 2021, uh, until fairly recently, the Abraham Accords were not much of the lexicon of the U.S. administration for lots of different reasons that we can talk about, likely not the purpose of this platform. Um, what wound up happening over those three years, only one major deal was brokered in the Middle East, and that was the deal in between Iran and Saudi Arabia brokered by China. And what wound up happening is a vacuum occurred as the United States of America did two things that were three things that I think has changed the Middle East uh, meaningfully from a place that the trajectory was peace and prosperity to now we're living in confusion, chaos, and, and, and much worse. Number one was we've given money to Iran. Uh, Iran is the source of all evil in the Middle East, or certainly much of the evil in the Middle East. Uh, when they are starved, uh, they are less powerful. When they are have money, they are far more powerful, and it's pretty much as simple as that. It was one of the earlier declared statements of President Biden that they want to re-enter into the JCPOA, the Iran deal, uh, and to re-strengthen uh, uh, Iran in the region. Um, the second thing is that many of the commitments that were made to the Abraham Accord country were not followed through on, and these weren't financial commitments. They weren't um, military commitments or intelligence commitments. It was really a commitment that if you are closer to Israel, we will be closer to you. Essentially, peace for peace elevates you uh, in our circle. And what wound up happening was UAE received uh, drones uh, uh, attacks and, and the U.S. was slow. I'd say slow to respond, did not respond meaningfully. Uh, Saudi came under attack in several different places and the U.S. was slow to respond. And uh, at the, the inauguration, you know, uh, President Biden said that he was going to make Saudi a pariah or MBS a pariah and, and, and re, re uh, uh, change the relationship that the U.S. has with Saudi Arabia. So I say all of that in order to tell you that the last two and a half, three years have been one where there's confusion in terms of where the U.S. is in the region, no confusion where China is in the region. And that actually makes things even more complicated because the U.S. saw China intruding into the region and then suddenly started to reassert itself in various different places. And that is hard to do because it becomes far more transactional than consistent relationship based. And that is a very long way of saying that all of the countries in the region have decided that the U.S. does not have a foreign policy, but rather there is a Republican foreign policy. There's a Democrat foreign policy. And that is very hard to game plan for. 
All of that leads us to the recently discussed uh, Saudi and Israeli normalization agreement, where the fu- foundational flaw or flaws to that agreement were, number one, negotiating publicly. Uh, there are several challenges with that, but we'll just say that it's not a good thing in the region to negotiate publicly. There are many, many bad actors in the region, and every time there's a public negotiation, there's an opportunity to be able to disrupt it, to distract it, or to sabotage it. And the second was the insistence of the current uh, American administration to make the Palestinians an essential component of the uh, future agreement that would have. And, and what's dangerous about that is it reasserts the Palestinian veto on progress. It remakes the relationship based upon the Palestinians. And, and those of us who have tracked this for a long time can understand that you can't base anything positive and forward-looking on the Palestinian establishment as it is, neither the Palestinian Authority and certainly not the terrorist murderers uh, the um, the Hamas, as we as we've seen, unfortunately, so uh, challenging over here. So, <clears throat> with that, as that agreement was being negotiated, that did not bring further peace and prosperity to the region, but rather it brought an enormous amount of unrest by people who did not want to see that happen, and unrest by people who saw that there was a wedge that could be driven in between now the Sunni states and Israel, because the Biden administration wanted to make the Palestinians a focal point of all of these relationships, even even having the uh, connectivity in between the region, no longer called the Abraham Accords, but the Negev Forum, really took Abraham out of it, which was a fundamental principle of this. And number two was it introduced again the Palestinians and the Jordanians and the Egyptians in ways that they were forced into it as opposed to choosing to be a part of it. And that was, that was a challenge as well. All of that created a region with... Um, Unrest, uh, indecisiveness, and and chaos. I, I will add to it the maritime deal in, with Lebanon and Israel. Uh, we thought it was a bad deal when that original deal was pitched five years ago. We did not think it was a good deal when that deal was signed over this past year. Uh, and and signing a bad deal in the region uh, does not help things. It, it also is another sign of weakness. And this goes back to the entire Middle East concept that you only succeed when you are strong. Uh, when you are not strong, things bad things happen, um, and and that's a that's a challenge. As well, all of that sets the stage with many, many, many other things. Sets the stage for this Saturday morning, where Hamas did what Hamas has always wanted to do, which was to go on a rampaging uh, pogrom against the Jews. There was no intention to conquer Israel. There was no thought that Israel could be conquered. There was a thought that one could sow terror amongst all of the people of Israel, and for several hours, they succeeded in doing so. Pardon me one moment, that might be an air raid siren. One moment, I'm sorry. It is not. That's an air raid siren from Herzliya. It's not us. Close enough, but not not us. Uh, My apologies. Um, and that led us to uh, to Saturday morning, where again Hamas did what uh, what Hamas has always wanted to do. This is who they are. This is who they want to be <clears throat> as a terror organization, a U.S. designated terror organization. And what wound up happening is at that moment, almost all of the thoughts of the region, as they were established three years ago, uh, changed. And uh, and Israel has gone to war. For the first time, not an operation, but a war um, in in decades, and the region has not seen Israel at war in decades. Uh, in a massive call up uh, of Israeli reservists and regular troops, uh, almost five hundred thousand. Many of you, I'm sure, have received news that this troop is missing something, that troop is missing something. Uh, Israel, in its wildest imagination, has never imagined uh, having this level. Of uh, of reservists both called up and responding to the call up, so it's a it, it's a problem, but it was it was a good problem to have the the country of Israel, which was just so incredibly divided just eleven days ago, um, feels incredibly united today with with mission and purpose. It's it's tragic and horrendous and horrible uh, that uh, that such depravity brought Israel to this point. So what does that mean? 
This means that um, Blinken has been here now twice in Israel. I am here in Israel, hence the air raid siren. Um, there are now relations with other Arab Muslim majority countries like UAE, Bahrain, and Morocco, in addition to Egypt and Jordan. Um, and the the there is not a sense of it is the Arab Muslim world against Israel at this point in time. There's actually a, a divided thought within the Arab Muslim world uh, in terms of how badly to condemn Hamas. Uh, in the past, uh, perhaps there would not even be a condemnation for something like this. Uh, but now, I mean, the UAE and Bahrain had very strong statements uh, for uh, Middle Eastern Arab majority countries against the barbaric terrorism that occurred. Um, and, uh, and that changes the equation to a great degree. Now, what is a little bit, uh, well, let, let, let me say the positive person. President Biden's speech, speeches, empathy, direction and leadership here have been positive. I disagree with everything that's happened in the last three years that have created a vacuum of power leading up to this past Saturday. But from Saturday onwards, both the speeches, the declarations, the conversations, and uh, and bring the carrier groups into the region, uh, I think were the right decisions. I think were important decisions. And I both appreciate and, and commend those decisions. I don't want to say those decisions were hard. I don't think they were hard. I think what we witnessed this past uh, weekend, or, or again, 10 days ago now, um, anybody who would be the leader of the free world, and frankly, anybody who was even a member of the free world, a, 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 a pleased member of the free world, would be able to condemn these horrific actions for what they were, to understand Israel's not right to defend itself, but obligation to defend itself, and to do away with the concept that Israel is allowed to or should live with this terror entity next to it, and there's an acceptable amount of incoming rockets that Israelis should live with because it has technologically superior uh, advantages, such as the Iron Dome. This was, as been described by many people, atrocities that are of Nazi level. The difference between the Nazis and Hamas is the Nazis had the um, dignity, if you want to use that word, to understand that they should be embarrassed by their barbarism and hid this and tried to destroy evidence of it. And Hamas live streamed it and GoPro'd it and publicized it. If you haven't seen the video of Hamas taking the sewer uh, pipes and showing in a braggadocious fashion uh, how they would fashion them into, into uh, missiles, you're missing out on exactly how they want the world to perceive them. So with all that, where does us wind up being? Egypt's response has been woefully disappointing. Uh, Egypt has the ability to create a humanitarian corridor for Palestinians who do not want to suffer the wrath of Israel uh, as Israel brings full war into Gaza. Uh, if people claim to care about the Palestinian people, uh, Gaza has never been fully surrounded by Israel and never will be fully surrounded by Israel. Egypt is a border and Egypt has an obligation to let Palestinians out. And if they will not settle Palestinians in Egypt, they have an obligation to help Palestinians become refugees elsewhere. Uh, that, that is a that is a classic uh, obligation that they have as a neighbor. And so far, their responsibilities have they, they've not lived up to their responsibilities in any way, shape or form. The rest of the Arab countries in the Middle East, uh, while there have been some meaningful statements of condemnation again, singling out UAE and Bahrain in a meaningful way. Um, it is disappointing that there has not been an Arab solution to help their brethren, Palestinians in Gaza, likely because they are also embarrassed by the horrendous barbarism that has occurred. And it is the job of the United States of America right now to coalesce our allies in the region, Bahrain and UAE and Oman and Saudi Arabia, and yes, Kuwait. Remember Kuwait, the one that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the United States of America, plus Egypt, plus Jordan. And to, and, and to be able to get a, a solution to be able to help these Palestinians leave Gaza and go somewhere else. It is very clear, at least to me, and I believe to most of the people who are currently in Israel right now, that the experiment of Palestinians governing themselves in the Gaza area is a completely and totally failed experiment. Uh, there needs to be new thinking in a meaningful way in terms of what this ultimately winds up looking like. I see that I've gone up against my clock. I have more to say. I don't know if we want to go to questions. I apologize. I can't see the moderator. Hi. Yes. Well, I am very interested in what you have to say as far as uh, uh, what what the end game is. What comes next? 
Well, I, Israel has a determination in terms of what is it going to do with Gaza. A, a great deal of this, by the way, and I know there are many influential people here on this forum, has to do with whether Egypt will do the right thing and whether the U.S. leading the rest of the Arab Muslim world will help them do the right thing. Number one, by allowing passage of non-Hamas terrorists out of the Gaza area into Egypt and to find them a new place where they can be for a period of time. And we can have a debate about what period of time means at any point in time that you would like. Uh, and to be able to figure out how Gaza and the problem that is the cancer it is will be ameliorated forever. The Israeli people today, there is no left. There is no right. There is no center. The Israeli people are unified in the fact that there cannot, will not, should not, and never should have been a terror center on its border. And that needs to be eradicated completely and thoroughly. Now, once that happens, you have a lot of questions. Will there be an appetite for Saudi-Israeli normalization? What will that normalization possibly look like? Will there be an appetite for uh, growth of the current Abraham Accords in between UAE and Bahrain and Morocco? And will the U.S. do everything in its, po in its power in order to say that this is the right direction forward, or will it revert to its natural form, which is two-state solution, green line, East Jerusalem is capital of Israel, which both is not tenable. And if you were to ask any Israeli today, there is no tolerance for any additional risk-taking in the region. I believe that every Israeli, again, right, left, and center, has decided that this is a region where you must be strong and you must be clear about who you are and what you are, or you will not be there the next day. And, and this is a new Israel, if you will. There was sort of the startup nation, central Israel, which was in the media for, for quite a while. This won't take anything away from the technology and the economy and all of the rest of the things that are happening in Israel. But Israel will first and foremost be a regional military superpower, and it will let the rest of the region know that. I think that that is a good thing for the Abraham Accords. I think it is very clear that Iran is the perpetrator of all of these problems. Iran will need to be dealt with. The U.S. administration will need to decide what that means. Um, and Qatar is the other X factor that I've avoided up until this point in time, because that is a very precarious scenario, hosting the leadership of Hamas, uh, who not only perpetrated the worst crime that any of us have seen since the Holocaust to the fall upon the Jewish people, but from the free and fair lands of Qatar, proclaimed a day of rage in the Western world. Not only did they perpetrate a crime, but they've now incited crimes and crimes of violence in our countries, in the United States, across Western Europe, etc., and are doing so freely. The Iranian foreign minister came to meet with the head of Hamas just yesterday. It could have been covert. The Qataris chose to uh, publicize that. These are all meaningful questions that the U.S. government needs to determine what it is going to do with these scenarios. We have a very meaningful military relationship with Qatar. We have a great military base over there, uh, but one has to decide how long will they allow a, I'll use the uh, air quotes, friend to sit on the fence. This is not a war of Israel and its uh, neighbors. This is a war of civilization. It's in between good and evil. You have to pick a side. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so an anonymous attendee, uh... Uh, as far as your strength comment goes, uh, states the Israel Defense and Security Forum is concerned that Israel has adopted a defensive posture that will eventually result in the inability to function. How can Israel get back to an offensive capability? And Yehuda follows up asking, don't you think that if Israel is seen to require American defense umbrella, such as two aircraft carriers, uh, transmits weakness to its enemies? Yeah, so you, excellent questions. Number one is, I don't think Israel is in a defensive posture. I think Israel has made some strategic decisions based upon how they viewed the world. I, I assume that most of Israel's defense budget has gone to Iron Dome and F-35s. What will happen in Gaza now will not be determined by Iron Dome or by F-35s. And there's a new world where Israel will do this. Israel is well-trained. Israel is well-armed. And whether they are not well-armed, they will get those arms. It is a first-world country that understands the value of each one of their soldiers and is now relearning that value in a meaningful way as well. I have full confidence that Israel will be able to execute the mission that they have as soon as they define what that mission is. That mission needs to be clearly defined. They will be able to execute that. Uh, in terms of does the U.S. aircraft carriers project weakness, um, the answer to that is definitively no. 
Um, I would like to see Israel stick with its policy of as it defends itself by itself. But there is no doubt that Israel is at the front lines of the war of Iran against the free world. And for the U.S. not to bring aircraft carriers to let Iran know that Israel will defend itself by itself unless you yourself get involved, in which case we will rain holy hell upon you. And that is appropriate for the superpower. That's a message not just to Iran. It's a message to China. It's a message to Russia. These messages should not be seen in a vacuum. I believe what we will see from Israel will demonstrate very clearly to all of its neighbors, friends and foes alike, that Israel will not be trifled with. I believe that Israel is having one in its war cabinet. It's been 50 years since the last time Israel was caught with its pants down on the Yom Kippur War. I believe that Israel will demonstrate in the upcoming days, weeks, and hopefully not months, that it will be 500 years until something like this happens again. I, it doesn't need the Israeli air, the U.S. aircraft carriers, but uh, it does not hurt. It do, it's not a detriment. Absolutely. Uh, so we have quite a few questions asking about what Hezbollah's involvement may or may not be. Uh, Ira Strauss asks, uh, if if they do join the war, um, is, is... tried to paraphrase and that went well. Uh, no. Um, so would Israel be wiser to strike Hezbollah preemptively, uh, destroying as much of its missile capability as possible, or is it wiser to continue waiting and avoiding ex- escalation in the hope that it won't happen? Well, I, I think Israel has a fundamental decision that it's going to have to make, and, and I'm optimistic that they're gaming this out right now. They don't want to live with a cancer on their border. They've done a spectacular job. I know it's very difficult to admit the, the great things that they've done right now, with Syria. Syria is not turned into a Lebanon. You have a Lebanon and you have a Gaza. It would be much worse if there was a Jordan and a Syria that were similar to those. So let's not forget the type of neighborhood that Israel is in, uh, its size and its scope. And while we think it's invincible, unfortunately, we've learned very clearly it is not invincible. So what will they do with Hezbollah? Here, here's my positive outlook on this and my fearful outlook on this. The Israeli Air Force is wide open. Uh, Israeli armed forces are well alerted and armed and prepared. They do not need to go into Gaza today. They don't need to go into Gaza next week. The Gazans are not going anywhere. And to the degree they go someplace, that is a win for Israel, right? That that, that part is not an issue. Uh, and so therefore, that is not an issue. Obviously, Israel needs to make sure that the hostages uh, are both located and isolated and they don't go anywhere. But as many Palestinians out of that that leave is is, is fine, I think, from Israel's perspective. Um, they will approach, they will deal with the Hezbollah issue in a way that needs to be dealt with. And what I mean by that is, I don't believe that there will be a war with Hezbollah, and I'm optimistic that that will not be the case. But if there is, I will paraphrase what Nikki Haley said in 2017. There will not be a war in between Israel and Hezbollah because there will not be a Lebanon. Uh, The deterrence that needs to occur is not Iron Dome. It's not David Sling. It's not the the cool laser jets that they have now that can shoot things. They don't have enough of that. The deterrence is is that Lebanon will be wiped off the face of the map such that when you touch it on one of those touchy globes, there will be an indent where Lebanon used to be. That is the deterrent. And I believe Israel's will is there. Don't question Israel's will today. Uh, and they want that message to be incredibly clear. And Hezbollah, I believe, knows that. So if Hezbollah wants to fight a war to extinction, they will get some shots off. They will inflict some form of damage. And then they will no longer exist on this planet. Thank you. Uh, Gary Opolsky asks, it seems like uh, Egypt is dismissing Israel. Why won't they let uh, women, children and foreigners out? And what exactly is their end game? And what should the U.S. do, if anything? I don't have a problem if Egypt uh, dismisses Israel, although that's fairly hypocritical based upon the private conversations that exist between the two countries. But the way uh, Secretary of State Blinken was received in Egypt yesterday as an American may be very disappointed. We're America. Uh, We've been staunch allies of Egypt for more than 30 years. We are enormous supporters of Egypt. If we make a request, um, it might sound like please, but it really ends with an exclamation point. And I think if we felt this is the correct strategy, we have the power and the ability to bring this to play. I don't know what the end game is. It is not possible. Look, this is this is up to you and the Israelis to, to, to let the whole world know that Gazans have a choice. If Egypt has taken away that choice, that's on Egypt and the Arab world. 
That is not on Israel. There's exactly one Jewish nation, and the people of Hamas have decided to try to kill every member of that Jewish nation. Uh, they have not expressed that to Egypt, so therefore it's incumbent upon Egypt on a human rights basis to work that out. It would be insane to ask the Jews in the DP camps to be the people to welcome in the Nazis after they are wanting to leave Germany. I'm saying that it is, it is as preposterous as that. So therefore, it would make a fair amount of sense for Egypt to do that. And there's a strong Arab world that has the ability to incentivize them, along with a strong Western world that has the ability to incentivize them if they so desire. We can't get trapped into the uh, traditional thinking where we say Egypt says no or some other country says no, and we just say, okay, they threw up their hands, they tried their best. There is no try their best. The entire paradigm has changed uh, due to the utter brutality and, and pogrom mystic, that's not a word, massacres that occurred just 10 days ago. The, the world is different. The Middle East is different. Absolutely. So you said that you agree with the decisions made so far by the U.S. government. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, will Israel be able to withstand U.S. pressure to stop before being able to destroy Hamas? Should they? Should the U.S. Uh, say no aid until you accept a ceasefire or change their minds so far? Right. So that's a good question. As I stated, I have been pleased with what the administration has done up until now. I didn't finish the sentence that the hard work is what happens tomorrow. Today, it's easy. Israel hasn't done very much and has become a, a sympathetic figure on the world stage. Uh, the U.S. should be proactively in every possible way, from the furthest right to the furthest left, explaining Israel and explaining Hamas uh, in a way that we haven't. Uh, this administration has ridiculed the, the, the democratically elected government. That hurts Israel. In the public sphere, it hurts Israel in every sphere from that perspective. Look at our elite academic institutions and be embarrassed that we consider them elite academic institutions. If you give money to them, please stop. If you go to them, maybe consider going to a place where they won't brainwash your kids to hate Jews. Uh, I mean, th these are things that we must take a stand at this point in time. If you've seen the news around the University of Pennsylvania, they had this Palestine rights conference just two weeks before the massacre. I'm yet to see a statement condemning the conference, which would have praised this massacre because they had people that stood up and and, and and promoted and praised Hamas. This is Hamas. That's not a secret. So with all of that being the case, the hard work for the U.S. is in front of it. It will have to withstand European pressure uh, and other pressure. Uh, but here's the advantage. America's America. It should do whatever it thinks is correct to do. And I'm optimistic that you as Americans will speak to all of your representatives to make sure that they do that. And here's the other secret advantage. I don't really think Israel cares anymore. I think that Israel woke up and saw that if Israel does not defend itself by itself, there will not be a Jewish people. And when that is the case, they've discovered that they have a security, not hindrance or nuisance, which is how it was described for the last 15 years, but existential threat on its border. It needs to deal with that existential threat. And I think it needs to send a message to the rest of the existential threats, how it deals with existential threats. So I, I I think America needs to do the correct job. It should do the correct job. We should encourage it to do the correct job. And Israel should not listen to America if America does not do the correct thing. Fantastic. Thank you. And you did mention that you said you had a few more things to say. Uh, so in our last minute or two here, can you just wrap up uh, what you'd yeah, like to with, add? With all of this, I'm incredibly optimistic about the future of the Middle East. I truly am. I think that, uh, that Hamas demonstrating who many of us knew they were, exactly who they are to the rest of the world, gives clarity. This is, as Reagan said, it is a time for choosing. I believe more people are good than bad. I think that we have a challenge in between the fact that there's been 70 plus years of educating extremism amongst the youth, uh, especially in the Arab world. But I think that social media uh, has a chance to show people the better way to live. If you look in the Middle East, where would you rather live? In Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Tel Aviv, Haifa, or in Cairo, or in, uh, or in Gaza City? And the answer is always in order. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Haifa, Tel Aviv. That's the order for the Arab world. Uh, the, the Saudi, look what's happening in Saudi. I think it's one of the most exciting uh, things that we are going to see in our entire lifetime. Israel needs to restore deterrence. And after it restores deterrence, I believe that the Arab world should do the correct thing. I, I, 
I've made this message lots and lots of different times. Please do not confuse these lunatic, the words that I would use are not befitting a rabbi or for this forum, but imagine the worst word I could possibly say, and then imagine it worse. And that's how I would describe these, these barbarians who did what they did just 10 days ago. And their leaders sitting in their cushy villas in uh, Qatar got together to, to, to do the traditional Muslim prayer of gratitude. There is no God that listened to their prayer. There is no Islam that represents that religion. There just is not. It's not a religion. That's a cult. I, I believe that there are fantastically great Muslims around the world who understand that they are perverting the concept of God. They are perverting the concept of their religion. And, and they will stand on the side of good against the side of evil. And in order to be able to do that, those of us who do not have a street and those of us who do not have baggage of decades of, of, uh, of brainwashing kids in our neighborhoods need to be the people to help lift them up and choose good in this battle. We absolutely need to do that. And at the same time, let's be extremely careful what's happening back in our home front. We see the region why there is such hatred is because their institutions of learning have bred hatred amongst them. Can we not look at our institutions of higher learning, in some cases our public school systems, and decide that we are not doing the same breeding of hatred as well? Uh, that's the sort of message number two. And the very, very, I've got two more messages. Uh, for all of us sitting here in Israel, we spend a lot of time in bomb shelters, and all of us know somebody uh, who has lost or has died. Uh, I was at three funerals so far and multiple shiva houses. If you don't pray, start praying. Uh, if you do pray, pray harder. If you don't give charity, please give. And if you do give, give more. Uh, feel the pain of the people here on the front line in a meaningful way. Please do that. And the second thing is, man, when I speak to my friends in America this past Friday, people didn't send their kids to school. People were nervous about going to synagogue. You all have friends. You are all people of influences. Do not be ashamed. Do not bow your head. Do not retreat. Don't be afraid. Show up to your synagogue. Show up to your schools. And if your kids are going to a school and you're nervous, then you get all of your friends to stand in front of that school and you serve as the shield to make sure that your kids can go to a school with pride, a JCC, uh, you name it. We do not cower. Uh, Israel is going to show the world that Jews do not cower. It's incumbent upon the rest of us in the free world to demonstrate that we do not cower either. We have allies. We have friends. This is not a hard battle. It is a battle in between good and evil. The evil are evil, but there are far more people that are good. They will join us in this. So uh, stay strong. Chazak, chazak, venit chazek. Stay strong. Thank you so much. What a great message to go out on. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you speaking with us. Sorry, I was late. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for Israel Insider. Thank you for joining us and a wonderful day.